Hi micro folks. So we are spring 2020 and we're working on our microbial genetics DNA replication audio. Let's see if we can't get it subtitled. Okay, there we go. Um, so this is going to be DNA replication, DNA synthesis part two. In the first part we went over kind of the big view and now we're going to look at um, the E. coli chromosome at the replication fork and we will discuss all the proteins and enzymes that are involved in replicating, making a copy of the chromosome. So the handout um, in lecture, the cartoon on the replication fork is better because they actually use names for the actual um, enzymes and proteins, but I'll just um, give you the names as we go. So first of all, do remember that the E. coli first had to relieve um, the superquilling of the chromosomal DNA, and that was done by a special topoisomerase called bacterial gyrase. So now the um, chromosome has been relaxed or relieved of supercoiling. So then the next thing is to break the hydrogen bonds between the two um, parent strands. So this would be the old parental chromosome. And that will be done by an enzyme called helicase. Helicase is going to um, travel along and break the hydrogen bonds between the two old parent strands, and then that will create our single strand templates here. <coughs> the problem is <coughs> that the two parent strands could re-anneal. That means they could reform their hydrogen bonds. Um, another problem is potentially they could tangle. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and a third problem is that bacteria have evolved enzymes that will destroy single-stranded DNA, probably as a way to protect them against bacterial virus, bacteriophage DNA. So to protect the single-strand templates, the bacteria have evolved these proteins called single-strand binding proteins, or SSBPs, and they'll bind to the single-strand DNA templates to protect them from reannealing, from tangling, and from uh, being destroyed by the bacterial enzymes. <clears throat> Now, one would think, especially if the, um, excuse me, the cytoplasm of the bacterium is chock full of those energized nucleoside triphosphates, you would think that DNA polymerase then could simply bind to the single-strand DNA templates and use them as guides to start synthesizing new DNA. But there is a problem. <clears throat> and the problem is that um, bacterial DNA polymerases require a short piece of nucleic acid um, a, for example, a short piece of, of RNA called a primer to get the new DNA synthesis started. So this is definitely a problem for the little bacteria cells. So the solution they've evolved is they use a special RNA polymerase, a special RNA polymerase, and um, these RNA polymerases use DNA as a guide to make complementary RNA. There's a special RNA polymerase called primase, that will bind to the single-strand DNA and synthesize a short RNA primer. We can see it here is kind of a darker green color. So there's the RNA primer. This um, enzyme right here, this would be our special RNA polymerase called primase. And as soon as that short little um, RNA primer has been made, then DNA polymerase 3 can come along and basically knock the primase off um, the DNA. And now the DNA polymerase, and the big workhorse in E. coli is called DNA polymerase 3, can continue um, synthesizing complementary DNA. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch from um, looking at this strand um, of DNA that's being synthesized, and we're going to take a look up here at this strand of DNA, um, um, new, new DNA that's being synthesized. <clears throat> so although we can't see it up here, somewhere back here, there would have been a little RNA primer made by, by the primase. DNA polymerase 3 would have come along, knocked it off, and then continued making DNA um, using the little RNA primer, um, making the DNA 5' prime to 3' prime and anti-parallel to the template. Now, this new strand of DNA, we can see once DNA polymerase 3 starts um, synthesizing DNA, it can just travel around the chromosome um, as the replication fork moves around the chromosome. And the DNA polymerase 3 never has to stop making DNA. So this strand is being made in a process called continuous DNA synthesis. <clears throat> Here it is. And it's called the leading strand. Okay, so this is the leading strand. And again, um, kind of nice. Once DNA polymerase 3 gets started, just 
keeps following replication fork, copies the chromosome until um, it hits the termination of replication. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> this opposite strand, this is a lot harder um, to synthesize the new strand, and it's because of the orientation of the template strand, right? So remember, our new DNA has to be synthesized in a five prime to three prime direction, and it has to be anti-parallel to the template, and that's going to be a problem down here. <clears throat> so the cells have evolved another way of synthesizing DNA, and this is um, DNA synthesis, which, which is called discontinuous DNA synthesis. And this new strand is going to be, this, this new strand of DNA will be called the lagging strand. So let's see if we can't try to <clears throat> um, see what the heck's happening. So initially, um, what would happen at the replication fork on this, on this opposite template strand, <clears throat> the um, primase would bind, synthesize a short RNA primer, and then DNA polymerase 3 would take over, synthesizing DNA. <clears throat> the cell would then wait until the replication fork opens up a little bit wider, and it would repeat the process. So um, the primase would bind, synthesize a short RNA primer, and then DNA polymerase 3 would take over, synthesizing DNA. Now, if we watch what's going to happen, this DNA polymerase eventually is going to um, ram into the RNA primer in front of it, right? So I, I almost wish this, this little enzyme wasn't there. So the problem is when DNA polymerase 3 rams into that RNA primer, it can't get rid of it. It can't remove the RNA primer. So the E. coli has another DNA polymerase called DNA polymerase 1, and here they don't have the numbers, but this would be our DNA polymerase 1. And what DNA polymerase 1 does, it knocks off DNA polymerase 3, takes over DNA synthesis. Um, it removes the RNA primer. It's going to hydrolyze the RNA primer and then replace the RNA primer with DNA. And you might think, well, that's great. You know, we've solved all of our problems. But the problem is now, on the lagging strand, we have all these little DNA fragments <clears throat> called Okazaki fragments. And DNA polymerase 1 can't link the, the um, end of the DNA that it's just synthesized. It can't link it to the DNA right in front of it. Now, these DNA fragments, as we said, they're called Okazaki fragments. <clears throat> so the last challenge, <clears throat> excuse me, the last challenge then for the E. coli is how will it covalently link its Okazaki fragments. And that's going to be done by another enzyme called DNA ligase. So DNA ligase is an enzyme that can covalently link the Okazaki fragments together. So following um, the activity of DNA polymerase 1 and uh, DNA ligase, we won't be able to tell the difference between the lagging strand, because that lagging strand will be one beautiful continuous piece of DNA without any, any RNA primers in it. We won't be able to tell the difference between the lagging strand and the leading strand up here, but it just takes a lot more work to get that lagging strand made. Um, we'd mentioned in lecture, just for those that are trying to cartoon this at home, on the opposite side of ORI, on the opposite side of, of ORI, the, or, um, the origin of replication, the leading and lagging strands, they switch. So, for example, um, if this was ORI, then up here would be the lagging strand. If this was ORI here, then down here would be the um, leading strand. But remember, I'm not going to ask that on our lecture exam, too. Okay, so let's just keep going here. So this is just so you could um, quiz yourself. So remember, bacterial gyrase is going to relieve the supercoiling of the chromosome, and you have to do that before the chromosome is replicated. Helicase is going to break the hydrogen bonds between the two strands of DNA, forming the single-strand um, DNA templates. The single-strand binding proteins will bind to the single-strand templates to prevent them from reannealing, from um, tangling, or from being destroyed by bacterial enzymes. Primase is a special RNA polymerase that's going to make the short RNA primer so that then DNA polymerase 3, our workhorse, can take over. And DNA polymerase 3 will be responsible for synthesizing most of the DNA but when DNA polymerase runs into an RNA primer, it can't remove it. So then DNA polymerase 1 will take over. DNA polymerase 1 will get rid of the RNA primer and replace it with DNA. And then finally, ligase will be responsible for linking, um, covalently linking the Okazaki fragments, the DNA fragments that we find on the lagging strand together. <clears throat>
So um, these are just important um, words, phrases to know for your lecture exam. Two, so know the leading strand is made using continuous DNA synthesis. The lagging strand is um, uh, synthesized using discontinuous DNA synthesis. DNA polymerase three is the workhorse. It does most of the DNA synthesis. DNA polymerase one um, can remove the RNA primers and replace with DNA. The Okazaki fragments are the DNA fragments. So they'll be covalently linked by ligase. And then, folks, this, this reminds me that on... Um, lecture exam two, one of the short answer questions will be a um, table um, comparing and contrasting DNA polymerases to RNA polymerases. Um, so we want to remember that DNA polymerases um, make DNA, RNA polymerases make RNA, um, but then um, some more significant differences. Um, one, a big one, is DNA polymer polymerases can perform this cool process called proofreading or editing. And what we mean by proofreading or editing is that if DNA polymerase has just added a new incoming nucleotide and the nucleotide it's selected um, doesn't carry the correct nitrogenous space, so we don't get correct hydrogen bonding between that new nucleotide and the um, template strand, DNA polymerase can get rid of that incorrect nucleotide and try again. So we call this process proofreading or editing, right? And it's amazing because with DNA polymerase, after editing, the final mistake rate will be about one incorrect um, nucleotide in every, and it depends on the gene and the author, 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 9th nucleotides. So that's a really, really low mistake rate. And mistake rates, when we're talking about genetic information, mistake rates are mutations. So this means that DNA polymerase has a really low, 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 what we call spontaneous mutation rate. But in contrast, RNA polymerases can't proofread or edit. And that means their final mistake rate is the initial mistake rate. And the initial mistake rate for both DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase is one wrong um, or one incorrect nucleotide in every 10 to the 4th, 10 to the 5th nucleotides. So this means then that the DNA polymerases, their um, mistake rates is what, 10 to the fourth, at least 10 to the fourth times lower than the mistakes rate made by DNA, excuse me, by RNA polymerases. So RNA polymerases have a much higher mistake rate than DNA polymerases. Um, and then another thing that's really important to remember in the comparing and contrasting DNA polymerases to RNA polymerases is remember DNA polymerases has to have a primer, a short little piece of nucleic acid before it can start DNA synthesis. And RNA polymerases, including primase, they don't require a primer. And remember, it's a special RNA polymerase called primase that's actually going to make the RNA primer for um, DNA polymerase. And it was really cool. I was reading in a biochem book, um, proofreading, editing, and the requirement for a primer. These, these um, requirements or properties are linked. So because DNA polymerase proofreads, it has to have a nucleotide um, on, on what will be the new strand to check to make sure that the base pairing is correct, right? And that's why it has to have a little RNA primer. It can't just start DNA without checking to make sure that the last nucleotide um, that's that's binding to the template strand, that it's, it, it, it's carrying the correct nitrogenous bases, that you have the correct um, number of hydrogen bonds formed and there's no buckling of the DNA. And that's why DNA polymerase requires a primer. Now, in contrast, RNA polymerases, they don't proofread. And for that reason, they don't require a primer. They can just land on the single-strand DNA template and start synthesizing complementary RNA. So I thought that was kind of cool. Now, in lecture, we made note that we're kind of like, well, who cares, right? Well, we want to remember that RNA viruses, RNA viruses like influenza virus, like, oh my gosh, coronavirus, um, these RNA viruses use RNA polymerases to copy their viral RNA, their genetic information. And as a consequence, since those RNA viruses are using RNA polymerases, they have a much higher mutation rate than DNA um, viruses have. DNA viruses use DNA polymerases to copy their viral DNA. And remember, DNA polymerases can proofread. They have a low mistake, a low mutation rate. The RNA polymerases viruses use can't proofread, and that means they're going to have a really high mistake rate, a really high mutation rate. And this is why we see such 
a rapid um, evolution of mutants in influenza viruses and in, um, unfortunately, our coronaviruses. We'll keep folks. So let me just check. We might stop it here pretty soon. Yeah. So what we'll do, folks, is we'll end this video here. This will be DNA replication part two. And then the next video will be on transcription. And this is where DNA acts as a template to make complementary RNA. And it's the first step in what we're going to call gene expression. And by gene expression, um, what we'll mean is how the um, DNA base sequence is going to be used to eventually make um, a protein. How the DNA sequence is going to decide the amino acid sequence of a protein. Okay, so we'll close this here, and then we'll follow with a, a transcription video.